I would ask you to open your Bibles to Acts 13, okay? And I'll just tell you, um, I thought it was a little strange when Jared mentioned, and, and it seemed so strange that he would name the series after himself. And I thought to myself, uh, <laughs> but how appropriate, right, that a work in progress uh, would be the series throughout the fall. Thank you for that, Jared, the chance to speak today. In, in some ways, what we're going to look at, I think we'll see as Jared leads you through this fall, that this series could be written by Spring Hill. It could be autobiographical. If we were to look into the Word and to see and to, and to think about the life of this church and the work that we do in going about obedience to the leadership of the Holy Spirit, in Acts 13, here's where we'll start, um, in verse 1, 2, 3, and 4. Uh, I'll read if you'll follow along. Acts 13.1 says, Now in the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manaen, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. It says in verse 2, While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work, do you see it there? For the work to which I've called them. So after they'd fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. And verse 4, the two of them sent on their way by the Holy Spirit, went down to Seleucia and sailed from there to Cyprus. It's my understanding we do pick up on a series that began in the book of Acts, perhaps in the spring, perhaps a, a bit of a break over the summer, a journey into the minor prophets, and now here we come again in the fall Returning to this idea of the work, you, you realize, of course, uh, the book of Acts, as we're, as we're studying, its original title, its original uh, in the Greek language is actually praxius. Praxius simply means, as we translate it to Acts, the works often referred to of the Holy Spirit. We would not be able to understand this praxius, this orthopraxy, this ongoing work of of the church without understanding Acts 1.8, where Jesus, before his ascension there, begins this book of Acts by promising the coming of the, this same Holy Spirit of God. That when he comes, Jesus said, you will receive power and you will be my witnesses. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the ends of the earth. As much a promise as it is one of our great commission passages. Not just the command to be witnesses, but rather the promise that when He, this Holy Spirit, descends from heaven in Acts chapter 2, those on whom He falls will receive power, will be the witnesses, even to the ends of the earth. If that does not take place, if this book of Acts, this praxis, this journey of and progress of the work of the Holy Spirit does not take place, simply put, the church does not last 2,000 years. Simply put, the church, the gospel message, does not even cross oceans and cross continents to see the birth of a church like Spring Hill. And that we today, sitting, gathering, just as we might be involved in going or gospeling or growing, as we gather and are faithful in every field, we too are part of this story. As surely as it's this Holy Spirit alive and well among us, in, in dwelling us, sealing our hearts for the day of redemption, as Ephesians 1 tells us. And so we look at this church then in Acts 13, we see, first of all, just a few verses to consider the players involved. Who are the, the actors in this drama? First of all, the church. Now, in the church in Antioch, it says there were prophets and teachers. And we've heard tell of the church in Jerusalem birthed in Acts chapter 2, how it was growing, and even through the choosing of deacons and the ministry of the Word in chapter 6, it was multiplying, it was beginning to increase rapidly. But throughout the first half of the book of Acts, this chapter 1 through 12, what we see in the matter of mission is spontaneity. It's spontaneous. It's not so much planned or intention sending, even as God had promised Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, we might wonder for the first few chapters of Acts why they seem to linger in Jerusalem. Why they find themselves, even, even after the stoning of Stephen, that as unnamed ordinary men began to scatter, 
the apostles themselves stayed on in Jerusalem. You see that those first few chapters, that those faces of Jerusalem and Judea, they happened spontaneously. So that a, a persecution... Or even a dream, a vision three times of a sheet let down from heaven. It's as if they, the church had to be prodded. The church had to be moved in order to, to progress through these concentric circles. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria. To come to this ends of the earth phase then. The first thing we would note about this passage. Something quite a, a drastic shift here in the narrative of the book of Acts. Is that for the first time we see an intentioned sending. Rather than spontaneity, rather than a scattering because of persecution, and what's beautiful in this passage, what makes that intention sending possible? First of all, it is, it is that if for the first time in the book of Acts, the bride of Christ takes her place. Now, in the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers, these five names, and while they were praying and fasting, in that moment, the Holy Spirit introduces us to that bride, introduces us to that paradigm of mission sending that has carried the Great Commission for 2,000 years since. That in fact, the bride of Christ, the church of Jesus Christ, takes her place as they gather the venue of the Spirit's words and becomes the sender to the nations. Do you see it? As they were praying and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart, set aside as holy, if you will, set apart Barnabas and Saul, we know these characters, for the work to which I've called them. And in verse 3, after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. Do you see it? The from church to church paradigm of mission is initiated right here. As we think about what we've heard so often from Brother Jared, indeed a work in progress, as we think about the, so often the notion of being faithful in every field, we, our mind rightly goes to that upper left quadrant. Maybe there's even a slide that might remind us that from the, in the midst of gathering, this paradigm of mission sending, that from church, the going, the gospeling, the growing of new disciples leads us right back to gathering in the next generation of church planting. The next generation of church starts. We know, autobiographical, right? We know that at some point in the history here in Missouri, a church, maybe we would have a hard time pinpointing it. Maybe some of you would remember, would recall at some point a Baptist church sent out Baptist workers, Baptist members to start a Baptist church on Spring Hill. This is our story also. This is that paradigm that has carried the Great Commission. As we gather, we send from church to church. And by the end of this chapter, we'll see, even as this series progresses, the leadership of your pastor, you'll see over and over again, the same process is going to repeat itself. In fact, it's from gathering the Antioch Church to the establishment of Galatian churches. Here in this, what we call the first missionary journey, Acts 13 and 14. Cities like Iconium and Lystra and Derby, where new believers, having heard the gospel, new believers will be grown into maturity, will gather as church again. If the church is there on the scene, if the church is taking its place, you realize in the intention sending of these workers, you realize obviously the other and most important player in this scene is the Holy Spirit. I wonder if I asked you if you've ever heard the, the voice of the Holy Spirit of God. I wonder how we would respond. If we, if we thought back, if we passed the microphone around the day, how many of us would give testimony to say, I heard the third person of the Trinity say, and how would we fill in that blank? Would there be consensus among us? Because even in the hearing, even in the speaking, there's this corporate dynamic where he speaks to the, through the leaders to the church of God, and the church agrees, recognizes this, in fact, is the voice of the Lord. And before you think, well, yes, Nathan, of course, we hear from the Word, we hear from the Spirit of God, I want you to realize how rare it is across the Bible 
That words are actually credited to the third person, to the Spirit of God. Then we have 2 Peter 1. We have the Apostle Peter telling us at the, in the last two verses of 2 Peter 1 that above all things, you must remember this, no prophecy had its origin in the human's will. But rather, prophets spoke from God as they, and it literally says, the last verse of 2 Peter 1, as they were picked up and carried along by the Holy Spirit. This is where the, the Word of God comes from. It is the breath of God. It is the Spirit of God. As sure as it's His Spirit in Genesis 1-1, hovering over the waters from the beginning, this is that Holy Spirit who gave us the inspired Word. And yet, as you look across, obviously... As you look across in the New Testament, we have the words of Jesus. We've even colored them red in a lot of our Bibles, right? Through the incarnation, Jesus speaks clearly. And with a a literal voice and a literal mouth and, and and, and words, He speaks and He guides and He directs His disciples. He gives us instruction as we have it, reliable and assured. And at His baptism, we... We would recognize even a voice spoke from heaven. People thought it was a a clap of thunder. Do you remember? When when Jesus was baptized, the voice came from heaven and said, This is my Son. Listen to Him. In whom I'm well pleased. Or on the Mount of Transfiguration. You remember, to call that voice, to call out in the recognition of His Son, obviously the voice of the Father. We have the... The Father speaking into history. We we quote Him throughout the Old Testament for that matter. We have Jesus' voice. How rare is it, in fact, that the third person is quoted the way He is here? And why does this matter? What you recognize in the turning in Acts 13, the transition here in the book of Acts, not only is the church taking its place as the sending base of mission. We also recognize that same Spirit of God promised to empower, promised to mobilize us as witnesses in Acts 1.8, chooses here to be heard. As far as I can tell, as I've examined and in in preparing a message from Acts 13 some years ago, reading the New Testament through twice in order to look for and underline where is the Spirit of God speaking? We can see his voice very clearly credited in Acts chapter 8. You might have that passage. It'd be Acts 8, it's verse 29. When Philip is led by the Spirit of God to go to the road there that goes through the desert toward Gaza, he comes upon a, a, a chariot, do you remember? And that Ethiopian, the, the treasurer of the treasury of Candace, and the African princess there he's he's in the chariot and it's the spirit of god verse 29 that tells philip we can quote him in that verse the holy spirit told philip go stand by the chariot as if the the transition to the ends of the earth phase of mission from judea samaria where philip had been ministering now ends of the earth and in that moment in that transition to an african coming to faith The Spirit of God chooses to speak, uses His voice. What simplest? Stand by the chariot. I could have got that right, right? Stand by the chariot. How the door opens for the Gentiles. How the door opens for the continent of Africa. The first believers that go across and out of the Holy Land in the Middle East into North Africa. Specifically because the Spirit pushed them forward. Second time in, in the New Testament where we're going to see the third person quoted. Do you know where it is? It's in Acts chapter 10. I could do this part as well. Peter was sleeping and resting on the roof. And while he was in his slumber, three times he has a vision of a sheet coming down from heaven. Do not call unclean what I've made clean. Do you remember with the animals and the the detestable food that Peter, how could I do this, Lord? And and it's as if the the angel of the Lord, it says specifically, kicks Peter, wakes him from his stumber, and the Spirit of God said to Peter, Acts 10, verse 19, there are three men at the door. I've sent them. Don't be afraid to go with them. And as Peter responds to the voice of the Holy Spirit, he's led towards the house of Cornelius, 
a Roman centurion, where once again an ends of the earth phase of mission begins, that this Roman officer, similar to how the Spirit's voice led to a North African, this Roman officer becomes a doorway through which the Gentiles, through which the ethne, the Romans even, begin to hear the gospel. An ends of the earth phase of mission. So that both times, each time the Spirit speaks, He seems to be reserving His voice for this notion of the nations. For this notion of missions even to the ends of the earth. I don't know if you realize how thankful we are that He broke in and spoke into history like this. It's a direct chain, it's a direct path in discipleship and church planning to North Springfield where we find ourselves once again gathering but with a specific work, a specific purpose. And the Holy Spirit said for the third time, for the first time in the New Testament, speaking to the bride, the church itself. Imagine the wedding that takes place in heaven and imagine the groom, God himself, speaking to the bride, the church and what are the vows? What are the words that are going to be exchanged? The Spirit of God is going to initiate, just as He's going to direct and empower, He's going to initiate sending, intention sending to the nation. Set apart for me, the Spirit says, Barnabas and Saul. And I have it underlined for the work to which I've called them. Do you see it there? And what, Paul, what Luke is introducing here is actually a, a literary device. You say, what do we mean by that? What, what Luke is introducing here is called an inclusio. It's like, a, it's like a set of brackets. It's like a set of bookends on a library of instruction that might be on your shelf. And the, the first of these brackets is literally the, the two words, the work. I have it underlined in verse 13, chapter 13, verse 2, the work to which I've called them. The, the, this section of Scripture is going to be introduced by this bookend, by this bracket. Let me show you the backside of the same bracket, okay, of the inclusio. Look at Acts 14, 26. What do we often call the, the first missionary journey, Acts 13 and 14. In 14, 26, Paul comes back and Barnabas... Saul, now called Paul, and Barnabas, they returned to this same place from which they'd been sent, Antioch. Look at it in, in 26, 14, 26, the end of the first missionary journey, as we call it. From Italia, they sailed back to the place from which they'd been sent, Antioch, where they had been committed to the grace of God, look at it, for the work they had now completed. I called this a, a literary device. It's like a, a set of brackets. Luke, the, the writer of the book of Acts, is telling us, start this section right here, 13.2. If you want to know about the work of mission, start it here. And just so you know that you should read these two chapters together, here's the same bracket on the other end. It's an inclusio. It's a, to be included. What Luke is saying, read this together. The work the Spirit initiated, 13.2, is the work that had been fulfilled, completed, accomplished, 14.26. It's right that we call it a journey. It's right that we think about these two chapters together. Luke intended us to read it as a textual unit, as one section. The work. And Jared was kind when he introduced and said, Nathan won't shut up about Acts 13 and 14. That's what I heard him say. He, any chance we get to talk about it, do you know why that is? My, my wife and I went to college in this town. She went to Drury. I was a, it was still SMS then. We found ourselves on mission. We found ourselves compelled coming out myself out of Broadway Baptist Church right down the road to go and to be sent on mission, believing it was the Spirit of God sending us to do that work. But you can imagine getting to the ends of the earth. Can you imagine pioneering, gospeling, looking to grow disciples so that you could gather new churches in your early 20s, cross-culturally with languages you've never imagined amidst a worldview that's so foreign in the nation of India, in the nation of Nepal, where we live to this day. 
Why would we love such a passage? Can you imagine those days and those nights when, whether by just ignorance of the culture or language, feeling like a second grader trying to understand and communicate with people in a different language, can you imagine the sense of futility or just an inability to accomplish what you may have been sent to do? And you're, lo- and you're lo- asking the Lord. Maybe you've read Psalm 90 and you're, you're saying, establish the work of our hands, Lord. Establish the work along with Moses who wrote Psalm 90. And you're wondering, how do we go about? What is it we should put our hand to when seemingly so much to do among more than a billion lost South Asian souls in the nation of India? You know what you do in those moments? You plead, you ask, Lord, would you show me how to do the work. Lord, would you, wouldn't it be great, Lord, if you would just put a, put a set of brackets around a passage of Scripture and says, spend your life learning and loving and wrestling in this work and you can't fail by the power of the Spirit of God. Imagine the, the excitement in your heart when it dawns on you that the answers to your prayer, what, how do we do this work? What would we put our hand to? Imagine the, the delight when you realize the Spirit of God tells you, Nathan, because it's sufficient for faith and practice, I need you to know, Nathan, the Spirit of God is if he says, I answered your question 2,000 years ago. It's in the Word of God. There's a work. There's a work. That can not only that's in progress, but that is compelled in the hearts of churches and the, the lives of leaders and believers who would consider going to the ends of the earth. What possible reason would you have to think you could accomplish something but that the Spirit would use the same word to define it and shape it and teach it to you? And so these brackets, this work, beg the question. If the Spirit of God sent them to do a work... And at the end of that same missionary journey, they can come back to Antioch, come back to Spring Hill, and declare a report on a work that is fulfilled, completed, accomplished. Something that had been done with integrity. Wouldn't you want to run to that passage? Wouldn't the question be begged, what, what did they do? How did they spend their time? Where and, and, and what were their priorities? What were the, the metrics? What it was accomplished so that they could say it was done? That they had done the work with integrity? And we know, we know, you can anticipate exactly where this series goes because you know your pastor. You know that they're going to be about going. There's going to be city after city across this series where they're pioneering. Across, throughout, in fact, it says the island of Cyprus all the way to Paphos. They're going to cross over the mountain range from the beach, presumably skipping over a city called Perge because the winter perhaps was coming. They're going to come to and pioneer in a city called Pisidian Antioch. They're going to travel across to after Pisidian Antioch when they're run out by persecution to Iconium and Lystra and Derbe. And, and, and having pioneered in all these places, they're nine times. They're going to proclaim the word of the Lord, the word of the Lord. The word of the Lord. The gospel is going to be preached. In fact, at Pisidian Antioch, the longest sermon of Paul in the New Testament, of, in the book of Acts, comes to us in chapter 13, where 25 verses, 25% of the entire journey, in chapter 13 and 14, dedicated to one sermon, one presentation of the gospel. Don't be surprised that they twice, the audience twice chokes on the resurrection when he proclaims the fullness of that gospel, it's the resurrection of Christ that causes them to stumble. Those that were not prepared to hear that Christ, in fact, is God. Four times, beginning at the end of chapter 13, four times, you wouldn't be surprised, as you know your pastor, to see that they're involved in growing new disciples. The word itself, disciple, is used at the end of 13 and three additional times in chapter 14. Where they circle back. It's not enough that they have engaged or pioneered that they've gone and gospeled. They're going to circle back. Get this. Even to places where the non-believers tried to crush Paul's head with rocks. 
Having traveled through Derby, won a lot of believers in that city, they reversed course going back to Lystra to the very place they stoned him, thought he was dead, and drug him out of the city. They go back to strengthen the disciples. You can read it there in chapter 14. With these words, through many hardships, we must enter the kingdom of God. Disciple-making, growing, faithful also in that field we call disciple-making. As you know, your pastor, and I'll just tell you, you know, uh, as we get to this point, this is not my first time to, to come back to Spring Hill. As I get to, to come and go from the U.S., this time without my family, a rather short trip as we come through, I know that your pastor is getting more comfortable in having us around. Because, it, it, in fact, as you, as you might not know, uh, perhaps you need to check him on his comfort level. He didn't actually tell me what time service ends today. I noticed that for the first time. Now, is that trust or is that an oversight? Nevertheless, he comes to back in 1420. Three. Look at that verse with me. Having gone, having gospeled nine times across, having discipled, seeing about the growth, the faithfulness of growing those disciples four times, 13 and 14. Look at 14.23. What does he leave in his wake? It says, Paul and Barnabas, as they returned through these various fields, appointed elders for them in each church. And with prayer and fasting, committed them to the Lord in whom they had put their trust. Do you see it there? So it wasn't enough that they pioneered. It wasn't enough that they gospeled. I keep turning it into a verb. I hope you're okay with that. It wasn't enough that they were just growing disciples. No, as they went back, you see, in fact, it's consistent across Paul's journeys. They're consistently leaving churches organized in their wake. And we started that way by saying, from Antioch to the establishment of Galatian churches, it would be right, even as your pastor intends, that at some point after studying and reading these two journeys, excuse me, these two chapters, the first journey, that you would pause and consider the book of Galatians. Because it's that letter that's actually written back to these same towns, Iconium, Lystra, Derby, even Pisidian Antioch, where churches had been established. There was a need in the midst of sheep that are being gathered to appoint shepherds. So elders here, the same interchangeable word for pastor, elder, overseer, these leaders that had emerged from the harvest field were recognized as the leaders of these churches, the shepherds of these flocks. So that as surely as we have a gathering and going from Antioch, gospeling and growing, we, come, we find ourselves full circle in returning to Galatian churches that are being gathered. How do we understand the work? The work that is in progress. It happens in the life of Paul and Barnabas. It happens in the life of the Antioch church as we go from church to church. One final step would be that leaders emerge there, shepherds. And it's the same field, by the way, a free commercial in chapter 16, verse 1. When Paul comes for the second journey, he meets a young man named Timothy that comes from the church of Lystra. And that same Timothy, not just shepherds for the local flock, but sent ones who would again join him, multiply his teaming effort, and move on toward Macedonia, where the entire process could happen again. This is a work that the Spirit of God initiated. It's amazing to hear him speak. It's amazing to think. And we ask these questions, we look at this work, and we think about the truth that in Galatia, not, every, not everyone had heard the gospel. Not every believer was mature by the time Paul returns to Antioch. Certainly, we wouldn't say, having read the book of Galatians, a letter, a letter that comes much later, we would never say that every one of these Galatian churches is healthy. Spoiler on the coming Galatian study in this series, uh, they've got a few issues, a few problems to address. So how is it if not everyone's heard and not everyone's mature, disciples mature and not every church is healthy, how can Paul and Barnabas return to Antioch and say, the work's done. The work the Spirit sent us to do is fulfilled, completed, accomplished. 
26. We read that as the, the back end of that bracket, right? Well, you realize that not only is the Holy Spirit going to continue to grow, but even as the sent ones who plant the church return to Antioch, considering their work done with integrity, considering their work fulfilled, completed, accomplished, it seems that the work of the Galatian churches, let just organized, gathered in their wake, is just beginning. Do you see it? The sent ones, the ones going about planting the church, could call their work finished, called it accomplished with integrity, and in part because the Spirit of God was going to work through the Galatians. The same way that from church to church paradigm has worked across two millennia of time all the way to North Springfield. The Galatian churches are about to step into their inheritance. They, in fact, might be the work in progress. Do you want to see it? We have five more minutes, don't we? Look at Acts chapter 13, the end of Paul's sermon in Pisidian Antioch. Now certainly your pastor is going to lead you through this chapter in the coming weeks. So I won't steal all of his thunder, but I want to show you something beginning in verse 46. 13, 46. What was the work the Galatians were going to do after Paul departed? So this is the second week, the second Sabbath, when Paul and Barnabas are invited back, they're rejected. Their message is creates jealousy among the Jewish leaders. And this is what Paul says to those who were objecting. Then Paul and Barnabas answered them boldly, We had to speak the word of God to you first. Since you rejected and do not consider yourself worthy of eternal life, we now turn to the ethne. Your Bible has Gentiles there, right? The ethne, the ethnos, the people groups, how we translate it today. For this is what, look at verse 47, this is what the Lord commanded us. Underline us right there. What has the Lord commanded them? I have made you a light to the Gentiles that you might bring salvation to the ends of the earth. Read it with me, verse number 48. When the ethne heard this, they were glad and honored the word of the Lord, and all who were appointed to eternal life believed, and the word of the Lord spread through the whole region. The most shocking word in all of what I just read is the word us. This is what Paul says and Barnabas say, this is what the Lord commanded us. And what is it the Lord commanded? We see the quote there, right? I have made you a light for the Gentiles that you might bring salvation to the ends of the earth. Paul and Barnabas, having read Isaiah, did something that would have got me Questioned in any preaching class in seminary. I want you to see this. Have you read the suffering servant psalms of the book of Isaiah through the 40s and 50s? Of course you have. Those psalms, those chapters of Isaiah are about Jesus, the suffering servant, the, the one who would come and redeem the world, correct? If those chapters, including chapter 49, it is too small a thing for me to make you a, house, a light to the house of Jacob. I'll also make you a light to the Gentiles, that you might extend salvation to the ends of the earth. If you're in a seminary class and you take that passage clearly written about Jesus, the coming Messiah, and you say, God, God was talking about me in that verse, you're going to have a hard time convincing your professor to not fail you in that. Wait a second. There's something deeper here. And hermeneutics professors see this too, I promise you. Paul and Barnabas, how could they take a passage, a promise given concerning Jesus, and say, that's about us. We're to be a light to the Gentiles. How could they do that? Well, it just so happens. We've read in the book of John, when Jesus says, I am the light of the world. You've read that I am statement in the book of John. Did you know that Jesus Christ, in all of history... Jesus Christ is uniquely qualified to in one breath say, I am the light of the world. And in the next breath, if we were to jump back to Matthew, say, you are the light of the world. You are the city on the hill that can't be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. No, they put it on a stand and it gives light to the whole house. In your same way, let your light shine before men. Jesus is uniquely qualified to both be the light of the world and to commission you as that light. Presumably, Paul and Barnabas understood it's too small a thing 
to call him a light to Israel, the house of Jacob. No, to the ends of the earth. And aren't we glad? Aren't we glad? Because there we are numbered among those ethne, among those Gentiles who languished in darkness. If someone hadn't shown the light, if someone hadn't taken up the same commission, and brothers and sisters, the work of the Galatian churches was just beginning. It was not Paul and Barnabas who carried the light across the region called Phrygia and Galatia. No, when the Gentiles, the ethne, heard this, they were glad. They honored the word of the Lord. All who were appointed to eternal life believed, and the word of the Lord spread through all of North Springfield. All of the region, it says in verse 49. Do you know that this is who you are? Do you know, hear me, like your pastor, it's okay that you're a work in progress. And it is absolutely okay that this church hears the voice of the third person. That the Spirit of God would speak among us. Don't we long for that? Again, we come back and we close right here. And you may say, Nathan, I'm not sure. Do you, think, do you think the Spirit of God still speaks to churches this way? That we could audibly hear and see, send this couple to France. Or gather for some, uh, lasagna lunch and, and get on a phone call with the missionaries you sent to the Middle East. Or consider the trips into South America. Or maybe even, maybe even now, every now and then, when someone passes through Antioch, give, them, give a missionary a microphone and let them preach the word a little bit. Do you think the Spirit of God is still setting apart and sending? If you're not sure, I'll buy you a lasagna lunch today. And you can hear all about it right after the service. Yeah. Buy you a lunch. Yeah. The question, rather, we might ask, does the Spirit of God still speak this way? My question is, do we pray and fast this way? This is not, I'm going to enjoy the lasagna. Don't get me wrong. My question is, when, when? We want to hear the Spirit speak. We want the Spirit to lead. When was the last time we abandoned our drive through Waffle House breakfast on the way to church and lasagna lunch after the fact. We had Waffle House this morning. Your pastor's never eaten, doesn't care. His kids have never had Waffle House until this morning. <laughs> Unfortunately, little Titus was ill. He's not with us this morning. Has a little bit of a fever. He'll bounce back immediately. Meant we got to take the proctors out this morning. When's the last time we set it aside? When's the last time we had that kind of hunger for God? Does he speak like that, Nathan? I don't know. Do we pray and fast this way? While the church was gathered, fasting and praying, the Spirit spoke. You think he'd speak to us? We go through the motions when we give that offering? Or are we cooperating? Are we cooperating even to send to the ends of the earth in a work that's in progress? Absolutely. There's micro sendings. I just, I just coined that phrase just now. Every Sunday when we say amen, at the end of our service, and we go into a world lost and in need of a Savior. There's a, a six day, seven day micro sending that will be initiated in the next two minutes as we depart from this place and engage people at Parfab or Bass Pro <laughs> or Missouri State. And I assure you, I assure you, the Spirit of God is willing to lead. The Spirit of God is willing to empower. As surely as He comes, he, you will receive power and you will be my witnesses. So says the book of Acts. So says our autobiography as we write the history of Spring Hill. Let's do the work. If you're considering a call, maybe you're, we're, we're all that church. Maybe, maybe today you're that Paul and Barnabas. Is that you? Is that you hearing? To be set apart and sent? We should expect him to work. Let's pray together. Jesus, we love you.
We thank you for your word. We recognize its truth. And Father, we would live on mission. And Heavenly Father, where you promised in Acts 1.8, you promised us power to do this work. You promised that we would be your witnesses. And Father, we expect it. We would look to it. Lord, if you'd be calling anyone out, may we hear, may we corporately acknowledge your voice, Lord, and set them apart, send them out. As surely in verse 4, as they're sent on the way by, by the Holy Spirit, we don't have confidence in them. We have confidence in you, Lord. Do that work. And use your bride to that end, I pray in Christ's name.